everybody, and welcome back to my Zero Carb Life. I am Kelly Hogan, and I'm here today with Dr. Jamie Seaman, board-certified obstetrician gynecologist with a background in nutrition, exercise, and health sciences. Also, oh my gosh, she's Dr. Fit and Fabulous, and I love her. So you may have seen her recently on the Titan Games with The Rock. You have probably heard that she is the 2020 Mrs. Nebraska. Girl, welcome to the show. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. I think it was just a matter of time before our lives collided. And I know everyone's very excited that we're on here together. As am I. Thank you. Okay, so I feel like in the carnivore world, I know that you, you've got quite a background in keto and you also have experience in carnivore, and you almost always stay carnivore-ish. But I am mostly interested in your experience as a doctor who has carnivore experience. That's what I'm so pumped to talk to you. And mm -hmm. I feel like in the carnivore world, the bodybuilder guys, they've got Dr. Baker. You've got the super brainiac scientists who've got the Saladino. You've got the people who are interested in the experience, the anecdotal evidence who come to the long term carnivores, you know, Charles Washington, and in the plus 50 women category, we do have Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, and she's out there preaching and talking all the time, but I think that that word does not get out quite as often by as many people to the women who are out there who are premenopausal and menopausal they have questions and they ask me questions that I don't know I'm 41 so I'm I'm headed there but I haven't lived it yet I don't even know what hormones I have or what they're doing right now I don't know so I'm specifically wanting to know for someone who is a fully adapted carnivore is menopause going to be expected to be any different for them and if they're having issues what other options do they have because they've already taken this huge leap and they've gone all meat and i i like to think you know me i like to think that eating only meat is going to solve it all but what are the limitations talk to me about hormones and womanhood yeah you bring up some great points and perimenopause and menopause just in general across the board, there's so much of a lack of information out there for women other than like what their friend told them or what their mom told them or whatever. And there's so much misinformation about hormone replacement therapy and options that women have when they, when they go through it, there's just so much controversy. So let's like break this all down so that it is a little bit easy to digest. So the like number one question I get from women that come into my clinic is in this perimenopausal, they're like, Oh my gosh, there's something wrong with my hormones. Yeah. Something's broken. Right. And when we think about hormones, you know, our hormones are secreted on a circadian rhythm, but there's so many things that affect hormone production, hormone, um, excretion, hormone metabolism, and the way that we get rid of hormones. So we'll talk about that for with estrogen in a minute. But basically, nutrition highly impacts hormones. Our hormones, our sex hormones, like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are literally made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the substrate which we need to make those hormones. So you want to be eating lots of fatty meat, right? So carnivores, perfect, right? Getting lots of that substrate in there. The other things, you know, movement, exercise, sleep, stress, environment, all these things do affect our hormones too. So although you may be on this like, optimized, totally carnivore lifestyle, you know, if you're not sleeping well, or you're super stressed, or you're abusing caffeine, um, you know, these other things really could be affecting your hormones too. So even if your diet's perfect, you always, they're kind of like my five pillars, nutrition, exercise, stress, sleep, environment. Okay. So, you know, if you're packing your meat in plastic containers and not sleeping well, you may still be, you know, having some issues with estrogen. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of the five things people need to understand. So it's not all nutrition, but that's a huge piece of the pie. Then let's talk about kind of the phases of a woman's life. So when you first start menstruating, that's puberty, right? We go through these incredible changes, breast development, pubic hair development, we start menstruating, and now we've entered our years of fertility, okay? That's where I'm at. I'm 30, about, soon to be 36 years old, and so in a menstruating woman, 
your physiology is a little bit different depending if you're in the first two weeks of your cycle or your second two weeks, okay? But then what happens is a woman is born with all the follicles, all the eggs in your ovary. You are literally born with the amount of eggs you will ever have in your lifetime, which is crazy, right? Because I have three daughters. So literally as my little baby girl, they hand me my baby girl in the delivery room. She literally has all the eggs of my grandbabies <laughs> inside her ovaries. Yeah. And so we're born with about one to two million eggs when we're born. But then by the time we start ovulating and releasing these eggs, we only release about 1% of them in our lifetime. Huh. We only ovulate about 400 to 500 cycles. And so as you get into your 40s, you're 41, right? So as you get into your 40s and you've gone through all these years of you know, fertility and you've released all these eggs, at some point, the pool of eggs starts to get diminished. There's right. There's only so many left you're born without, you can't make any more. As you enter these years where there's not as many follicles, that is called perimenopause. Um, basically every single month, your brain is telling your ovary, all right, 20 of you, 20 of you get ready. And in about 14 days, I'm going to select one of you as the winner. <laughs> and the one winner gets to release their egg and hope it gets fertilized by some sperm and the other 19 losers just go away. <laughs> so what happens is eventually your brain starts saying, okay, 20 of you. And all of a sudden the ovary's like, oh no, 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 no. There's only five of us this month. There's only, there's only five of us here. We're running out. The army is running out. <laughs> okay. And so when you have these months where, where you don't have all these follicles, you know, getting um, simulated, your estrogen production starts changing. So when you get to this perimenopausal transition, if you, if I were to draw you a graph of what your estrogen level looks like January to December of this year, let's just pretend you're very perimenopausal, Kelly. Okay. It looks like a crazy roller coaster, like one month it's high and then one month it's low and then one month it's high and then one month it's low. And then the hormone that balances estrogen is progesterone. So what happens is after that one winner is selected and the egg gets released, that little follicle that it got released from turns into something called a corpus luteum and that secretes progesterone. And so there might be some months, especially as you get very close to menopause where your ovary doesn't select a winner and the egg doesn't get released. Okay. Okay. And if that happens, then you don't have progesterone that's being produced. And so what happens is you have this crazy estrogen roller coaster happening and then progesterone is not showing up all the time. And this can cause a lot of problems for women perimenopause. And then once you finally go through menopause is what we consider to be something called estrogen dominance. Okay. Estrogen is an amazing hormone for women. It is the reason that, that we live longer than men um, because estrogen is very protective to our cardiovascular system. Okay. We have estrogen receptors in our brain, um, which is why we're smarter. <laughs> Sorry, men. we have estrogen receptors in our bones. So as we start to lose this estrogen production, and then we finally make that transition into perimenopause, our risk of cardiovascular disease goes up, our risk of dementia goes up, our risk of osteoporosis, osteopenia, you know, bone health, all of these things we start to equalize with men once we lose that estrogen. But before we make that transition, the real issue we have is we don't have a balance of estrogen and progesterone, okay? Okay. And so when we have that lack of progesterone, we can get estrogen dominance type symptoms. Now, what are those? Because some women, even in their years of fertility, have them. Patients like with PCOS. So any patient, anybody that's listening, if you've ever have been told you have like a fibroid in your uterus or a fibroadenoma in your breast or a polyp maybe in your uterus or your cervix, um, or maybe you just have very, very, very heavy periods, um, these are all symptoms of estrogen dominance, too much estrogen. So estrogen is good. We want, we want estrogen. We don't want too much of it. We don't want too little of it. Okay. It's just like everything in life. Like there's a U shaped curve. Like you want to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, um, what happens during this perimenopausal transition is we get a lot of estrogen and sometimes not enough progesterone. And there's no, this is, this is a normal, you know, physiologic process, but remember those five pillars we talked about nutrition, yeah. exercise, sleep, stress, those things really do help when people are transitioning. So I find that my low carb keto, my carnivore patients really do tend to have a lot less symptoms 
as they make this transition, right? Because they're doing a lot of the things they're supposed to be doing in the right way. They're not eating all this garbage processed carbohydrate junk. Um, you know, inflammation is really low. Um, they're detoxifying and metabolizing their estrogen really well because their system is really fine tuned. So I find that they really transition through this period, you know, really quite well. There may be women though that need some additional treatment. You know, for instance, progesterone supplementation is a very good during the perimenopausal phase. That's one hormone we do like to use. And I want to say, Kelly and I were, you, were, you and I were kind of talking about this the other day with hormone replacement therapy, and we can talk about that too. Um, is that a lot of people view hormones as like meds, right? And everybody's like anti-doctor, don't give me meds. Don't tell me I need that, right? My body can do this. And especially carnivores, right? We feel like this is, we found the right diet. This is, this is going to fix me. This, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, think of hormone replacement therapy as a form of biohacking, just like I get a PRP facial for anti-aging. I mean, these are just, think of hormones as biohacking because this, although this is a normal physiologic transition, there are benefits to hormones and there are clear benefits to hormone replacement therapy after menopause, even for carnivores. Okay. So in this perimenopausal transition, progesterone can help sometimes, um, especially with like if people are experiencing sleep issues or anxiety issues, progesterone can really help with that. But like I said, most people who really have an optimized diet don't tend to, you know, feel a lot of those symptoms. Okay. And then when you finally go through menopause, the clinical definition of menopause is when you haven't had a period for 12 months. So this is when your brain is screaming at your ovaries. Hey, Hey, I want to pick a winner. Right. And the ovaries are like, no, no, we're empty. Like the pools and there's no one left in the pool. <laughs> the pool has been drained. And so when you've gone 12 months with no periods, that is that is defined as clinical menopause. And what almost always happens is estrogen and progesterone, you know, go very close to zero. Sometimes we do make a little bit of um, estrogen after menopause. If we, if we have extra body fat, but the unfortunate part is most people who are carnivore are very normal weight because they've, you know, they've lost their weight. They, you know, are kind of at their body composition. They want to be at, they've got great lean body mass. And so these may be people once they do go through menopause, that, that these would be great candidates for estrogen replacement therapy. Um, so like I said, I, and I made a post the other day, if people want to go look at it on my uh, Instagram and Facebook, but we talked about this earlier. When we make this transition here, um, our risk of, of cardiovascular disease goes up. And that's because estrogen actually helps with insulin sensitivity. Now, if you're carnivore and you're not really eating carbs, this might, you know, this might not be an issue, Right. right. Um, but for people that are eating any carbs, you're going to start to get more insulin resistant and you're going to start to deposit a lot more fat around your visceral, called visceral fat. You see the old ladies with like a little tummy or the old men with a little tummy, but they got skinny arms and skinny legs because yeah. they've lost all their muscles, but they've deposited all this fat around their belly. Um, that's because of lack of estrogen in women. Okay. And then, um, because we have estrogen receptors in our brain, sometimes it causes our brain to slow down. We get a little brain fog. But sometimes carnivore people don't experience that as much because ketones are an alternative energy source for the brain. And so as our brain becomes less efficient, and less effective at utilizing glucose because we age um, and we're able to use those ketones, I don't think that these patients experience as much brain fog. And, and then the other thing is, is osteopenia and osteoporosis. And estrogen and testosterone is great for bone health. But once again, people who are meat eaters are eating tons of, of dietary protein. And then of course, because I'm Dr. Fit and Fabulous, I always recommend resistance training. So we have to put stress, we have to eat meat and put stress on the bones. Um, we have to tell, our brain has to tell our bicep that we still need it when we become 55 and we're menopausal. <laughs> so we have to put some stress on our muscles. I think that carnivore people transition really well. And I love to use keto and carnivore approaches in my perimenopausal and menopausal patients for all of these reasons that I've described, because it's an alternative fuel source for the brain. It's the, the meat is amazing for our bones and for body composition. Um, but there could be patients that, that may see benefit from adding hormone replacement therapy. And remember, it's like biohacking. It's not that it's not that you need a medicine. It's not that you need it. There are some patients that do just fine and don't need it. But there are studies that show within that five to 10 years of making that menopausal transition, um, 
that there's benefit to the heart, brain, and bones. And so it really, for some patients, might be something to consider, especially if you're one of these people that's doing all the right things. You're eating right, you're moving right, you're sleeping right. Um, if, if you're having hot flashes, night sweats, if you're just not feeling good, then it may be something to, to consider adding. There is something that I have kind of in the pipeline, you know, thinking about eating um, organ meats. So people that eat nose to tail, yeah. um, there are organ meats that you can eat that contain hormones like ovaries from a cow. <laughs> okay. and this, is something, this is something to consider in patients that are, you know, making this transition. That's another way. I mean, it's just like, um, if you eat the thyroid gland of a cow, you're actually getting small amounts of T4 and T3 hormone. So if you're very natural and, and even though a lot of the hormones that I use are bioidentical, that would be another way for like a nose to tail carnivore person to, to get some additional hormones. Oh, that's good info because there are some people and I tend to be one. If I do ever get a headache and it's pretty rare, I'll be like, James will say, just take a Tylenol. I'm like, no. <laughs> I hate to take anything. I just, I don't. I'm even one where people say, what supplements or electrolytes to use? And I'm like, I just eat meat. I mean, that's just part of the community that I've come from. We just truly try to eat meat, drink water. And I do think that's an amazing thing for most people to do. If they literally just did that, I think that fixes a lot. But I do see women who are going through menopause. And some of them say, I am eating meat. I am drinking water but I'm still having night sweats. And when they say that to me, I'm like, well, I'm the eat meat, drink water chick. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. this is good for them to know that there are some meaty ways that they could try to work on it, but also go to your doctor and ask, what would they ask to be tested? Yeah. So, um, they should go to their doctor and say they're interested in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Okay. And if you're, if you're still menstruating, you're obviously not menopausal, but that doesn't mean that your hormones not, might not be a little wacky. Now the issue with testing, because everybody comes in and says, well, doctor, just draw my blood, check my levels, tell me if my hormones are broken. Yes. The problem is it's not that easy. In a woman who is menstruating and cycling, if I check your estrogen level on each day of your cycle, every single day of your cycle, your estrogen is going to be different. Okay. So it's very cycle specific and somebody who is, who is actually still menstruating, it's very cycle specific. And like I said, one month I check it and it's low next month. I check it inside one month. It's low. So if I just throw estrogen at you, I could be making some of the months worse <laughs> just to make half the months better. Okay. So that's why just progesterone in that phase can sometimes be helpful. Um, most women don't experience the hot flashes and night sweats um, until they get very close to menopause. When that estrogen is getting below about 23 is when women will really start to experience those hot flash and night sweat symptoms. Um, but there can be other things that can help. First of all, light bedding. Our bodies were designed to be cool, cold actually at night when we sleep. So um, these new mattresses that are like thick memory foam that don't breathe, like you might want to look at your mattress. You might want to sleep naked. You might want to look at your bedding, like lighter sheets, lighter bedding. Um, because I find women that are like on these thick memory foam mattresses with that big fluffy comforter from Williams and Sonoma. <laughs> yeah. And that could be like exacerbating some of your, you know, um, heat production that you're having. Um, but you want to say, I'm interested in hormone replacement therapy, and you want to find a provider that's well-versed in this. And um, as you make this transition, you may want to consider estrogen replacement therapy. Now, there are a variety of ways, first of all, to test your estrogen. You can test with blood, saliva, or urine. There's pros and cons to all of them. Um, but you want to test that. And then um, you want to talk about how you're going to take the estrogen. So there are bioidentical estrogens that are available orally, like a pill you take, which I'm not a fan of okay. because our GI tract was never made to have hormones down it. So what happens is it goes to the stomach and then it gets absorbed and goes straight to the liver. And that is what increases slight increase of, of, of blood clotting because our liver makes our, our blood clotting factors. Okay. So estrogen was never made to be put down the GI tract. I am a fan, more of a fan of either transdermal, so through the skin, so our skin's our largest organ, it can absorb estrogen creams, gels very well. Um, you can also give it sublingual, so a little um, dissolvable tablet that goes under your tongue, that's another way to get estrogen. Um, or they make even subdermal implants, think of like, um, just like the size of a grain of rice and it goes under the skin 
and those last like three to four months. So there's tons of ways to replace it, all bioidentical forms, pros and cons to all of them. But these forms that are through the skin or under the tongue or subdermal implants, there's no increased risk of blood clot, okay? Not at all. Um, it doesn't go straight to the liver and tax your liver like that. And on that note, I want to talk a little bit about estrogen metabolism. It's okay that I just keep talking. <laughs> talk away. Okay. So, um, I've talked about how freaking amazing estrogen is, right? Yes. But estrogen is what I call a use it and lose it hormone. Okay? okay. So we want estrogen to run around our body and do all its amazing things for our skin and for our brain and for our bones and for our heart. And then we want to get rid of it. And we get rid of estrogen really through our urine and, and we poop it out. Okay. So you want to be pooping regularly. Okay. So if you're not pooping regularly, that could be affecting it. But what happens with estrogen, even our own estrogen that our ovaries make. Okay. Is after it does its little thing, it travels back to the liver and it goes through three phases of metabolism. Okay. We're just going to call them phase one, phase two, phase three. Okay. Phase one, and phase two are in the liver and, um, there are, pathways in the liver that are affected by things we eat. So we need cofactors like B vitamins, magnesium, right? So you need to be getting these things in your diet just to metabolize your estrogen in the correct way. And then there's a few genetic variations. So if patients um, have things like MTHFR or there's a gene called COMT, so there's certain genetic variations that maybe Kelly, you metabolize your estrogen slower or faster than I do. Okay. And so we want it to go through these, these first two phases because they're supposed to go through it in a very specific way. And if they don't, sometimes we, we make metabolites of estrogen that can be dangerous, ones that increase our risk for fibroids and polyps and, and benign breast, so benign things. And then breast cancers, uterine cancers, the most common estrogen cancer that a woman is going to get in her lifetime, breast cancer. So if your system is not working correctly at getting rid of your estrogen, it increases your lifetime risk of breast cancers, um, which is great news for, for keto and carnivore people because um, no insulin resistance, right? No right. inflammation, right? These are all the things that battle against the most common cancer. And then the only other one people really, even carnivore people, no plastic in your life, okay? No, um, don't be heating saran wrap. Don't be drinking out of water bottles that have, that have sat in the sun in your car, plastics are huge endocrine disruptors. So even if you're carnivore, get the plastic out of your world. Glass, stainless steel only. I, can I interrupt you for a second? <laughs> I know that everybody who's sitting here watching this right now is like, oh, Kelly. <laughs> because <laughs> I, um, I get a lot of McDonald's burger patties. But if I were to get them and then immediately come home and put them, and I keep them in the fridge, a lot of them in the fridge, but I should come home and immediately put them in a glass bowl, shouldn't I? Is yeah, that what you're probably would. Yeah, and that okay. the paper, if they ever wrap them, I mean, obviously you get patties, right? So they're putting them in like a container. As long as they're not heated in the container. But yeah, when you come home, I would like probably take them out. Or just put a little glass dish in your cart and just tell them to put them in the glass <laughs> I'm going to do this now based on this. I've never even thought about it. I, I really have not spent much time thinking about my hormones at all because things, that's what happens when things are working well. You know, I'm regular, things are working fine. But thinking about in the future, I, I've got a yeah. long way to go, I hope. <laughs> and yeah. so if I could every single day make a tiny change like, hey, instead of storing all these burger patties in plastic, I'm going to just put them in a glass dish in my fridge. That would be completely simple and a tiny thing I could work on. I like yep. that. Okay. I'm sorry. And then um, the other thing, if you're going through and getting, you know, six burger patties, the receipt, the receipt that they try to hand you. Yes. Say no, say no to receipts. Um, receipts are aligned with BPA. The thermal receipt paper is very high in BPA. And just saying, people look at me crazy at the grocery store. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want, they try to hand, they do the hit, like, I'm going to hand it to you. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I, don't want I had no idea. My whole purse is full of old wadded up receipts. Okay. And if you and if you touch the receipt and then put hand sanitizer on your hands, it yes. increases the absorption tenfold. So, yeah, don't think you're gonna like trick the system. Like you need to go wash your hands with soap and water. Okay. But well, um, I could be dead right now. But <laughs> I'm young, so I've lived this far. I'm gonna change. I will. I had just didn't know. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I'm yeah. Serious. So you got to get rid of the plastics. Okay. okay. So, um, okay. But back to estrogen. So yeah. 
phase one, phase two, we need it to go through those phases the correct way because if we don't, we could be making these crazy estrogen metabolites that increase our risk of estrogen cancers. And for men, because I know there's some man on here like, oh my God, can we not talk about women's hormones? <laughs> men, you make estrogen too. You make estrogen from your testosterone. And prostate cancer, right, one of the most common cancers in men, is it's like the estrogen cancer of men. So if you don't get rid of your estrogen the right way, so you don't take the receipt because your wife doesn't want to touch it. You throw it away too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise increased risk of prostate cancer in men if they don't get rid of their estrogen correctly. So then this third phase is the one where the estrogen goes down into your colon and there's an enzyme that's supposed to package it up like a little Christmas package and then you poop it out. And if you, um, if you <laughs> have abnormalities in your gut, if yes. your gut's broken because you've been putting garbage down there, um, sometimes it unpackages it. It takes the bow off the Christmas gift and you reabsorb your estrogen oh. through, um, through your gut and it goes back to the liver and it gets in this like crazy estrogen cycle. Like, Oh, I can't get off the train. I'm just going to oh, keep taking no. the train in a circle. Yeah. So yeah. So we need our body. We need our bodily processes to be working how they're supposed to be working. And I, and I do, like I said, honestly believe that people who are, are, or low carbon carnivore, these processes tend to work better because ketogenic diets, including carnivore are anti-inflammatory. They inhibit a protein that's a major driver of inflammation called the NLRP3 inflammasome. You say okay. that 20 times fast. As long as you're eating enough food and you're giving your, you know, you know, the B vitamins are huge. B vitamins are huge for this estrogen process and magnesium is another big cofactor. So um, you know, as long as you're, as long as you're putting the right things and all the little, you know, Lego parts in there, it should be, your body is amazing. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's, if you take care of it, it does what it's supposed to do. But like I said, once you lose your estrogen, once those ovaries are turned off, um, if you feel like you're symptomatic, or if you feel like you want to do a little biohacking, estrogen replacement therapy has lots of benefits in the first five to 10 years, um, after menopause. And so that would take a woman, you know, if the average age of menopause is 52 in the United States, that would take a woman to at least age 62. And, you know, they kind of say after that, you know, maybe there's no benefit go off of it because the average age is 71. But I tell my husband, I'm definitely living to be greater than 100. So I'm probably going to need my estrogen therapy till at least 91. <laughs> you know, let's say you stay carnivorous, you're feeling awesome menopause comes, your general plan is to do estrogen therapy. And you would think at this point that you would have no trouble going longer than even some people would consider. Yeah. So it's very individualized to each patient, but I have some women that are in their seventies and uh, one who's even in her eighties who still take estrogen replacement therapy um, because they feel great. I mean, they just feel like their mind works good. They feel good. Their energy's good. They're sleeping good. They don't have hot flashes or night sweats. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's very individualized. I mean, if you think you're going to live another 10 to 20 years, like maybe it's not time to wean off your estrogen. <laughs> why should, why do most people wean off? I mean, I assume it's not because they're just expecting to kill over. Why do they come off of it then? Well, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of controversial studies a number of years ago that came out that showed that it increased the risk of blood clot and stroke. Um, it increased the risk of breast cancer, right? But these are in patients who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're overweight. Um, they're smoking. Um, you know, they're doing all these other things that increase the risk of cancer. And if you put estrogen, it, it's like pouring lighter fuel on the fire, you know, in these patients who they're not eating well, they're not sleeping well, they're not moving well, they're not doing any of the things they're supposed to be doing. And you, you know, they come to you because they're like, well, I would like some estrogen because they think it's magic. I they see. think, oh, I just went through menopause. I gained 15 pounds just like overnight. Just give me some estrogen and it'll be like I'm 40 again. And that's not how it works. That's not how it works. I tell patients, I will give you estrogen, but you have to do all of these things too. Okay. <laughs> so that's why the people listening on here, I mean, if, if you're one of those people, you're live in this carnivore lifestyle, you're exercising, you know, and all these things, you're the perfect candidate, you know, um, for, for hormone replacement therapy. And when you say exercising, I just recently started incorporating more exercise into my life, although it is a very small and I'm sure laughable amount, Dr. Fit and Fabulous, <laughs> but I'm, it's just, 
it's not really my thing. But I do know that as we age, I want to remain flexible. I would like to remain strong. So I have started doing a sprint, a quick, very quick sprint before I settle in for TV at night. Mm -hmm. And then while we watch TV and just instead of just sitting in a chair, I get down and do push-ups and some squats. That's really about the extent of it for me. When you say exercise, I assume you are not implying that people should be on a treadmill for hours running. Yeah, I don't recommend that, actually. Um, those types of things actually are really good at wearing your joints out. All movement is good movement. I don't want anyone to think I'm telling you you're not exercising the right way. But if you want the most bang for your buck as you age, as a woman as you age, especially because we're talking about perimenopause and menopause, because we naturally lose about 10% of our lean body mass with each decade of our life. And as you lose that lean body mass, it increases your risk of metabolic disease. And although you're, I mean, at some point, your systems are going to start to break down, right? We cannot, we, just, we will not all live forever. That's like one proven fact I can tell everyone tonight. Yeah. Resistance training and maintaining as much lean body mass as you can is going to fight against a lot of those age-related diseases. And, um, you know, falls, like falling and breaking a hip at age 80, a lot of times is people's demise and you don't want that to happen. So, um, resistance training is going to give women more bang for their buck. And just from a societal perspective, it's just, you know, women are like, Oh, I don't want to feel, I don't want to be big. I don't want to be bulky. I don't want to bulk up. I just want to tone. <laughs> yeah. There's no such thing. Like it's very genetic. It's very genetic. Like how big your biceps going to get. Um, but you're really just, you're, you're not going to get huge, but you're, you're going to be healthier if you incorporate some resistance training. It's good for your bones. It's good for your joints. You're right. Flexibility is important, but cardio is just not, it's just not that valuable. Man, I'm glad to hear that. It's really hard on your joints. It's really hard on your joints. It really is. I used to, um, I went through a phase as I'm sure no one could guess. I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of girl. And at one point I decided I was going to really exercise. Now this was when I was first losing weight and first discovering, Oh, carbs were my problem. Okay. I had no idea. And, and so I was really getting control of how I looked and, and even how I felt and inflammation was coming down because I stopped getting these boils and stuff. And I decided I'm going to exercise. So I was hitting the gym every morning immediately doing cardio for an hour before work and an hour of cardio after work every seven days a week and if it wasn't before after work it was before after church or before after you know whatever I was doing on a Saturday and um I did get skinny <laughs> you know and I also my periods got really weird and then eventually stopped stopped I didn't have a cycle for two years so your, your estrogen was really low. I would imagine. I was working very hard. I also was not eating nearly enough fat back then. I know this now. I had never even heard of yeah. rabbit starvation. Basically, I was an obese woman who was told, don't eat carbs. But I didn't read enough to know, oh, but you seriously need fat. I was just like, okay, I will not eat carbs. So chicken it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're basically on a protein sparing modified fast. <laughs> and I felt I felt very bad. I did. Uh, it yeah. did not it I had mental fog and no cycle and my skin just dried out horribly. I felt yeah. lousy. Meanwhile, I'm exercising cardio morning and night. I just want people to know when you're saying exercise this vision of what I was doing, that is not it. So remember that exercise is a stress, a purposeful stress on the body, right? If I'm going to walk out into my garage and perform a deadlift, that is a purposeful stress on the body so that I put my muscle under stress so that it builds it stronger. Okay. Um, you can overtrain. You can oversteer <laughs> in anything. <laughs> and you actually bring up a really great point, Kelly, is that when you are you know, transitioning into this lifestyle, some people who have kind of that personality that's kind of like all or nothing, you can oversteer. And if you are, you know, transitioning into any kind of keto or carnivore lifestyle and you start missing periods and these types of things, you're probably not optimizing it in the right way. And you need to, you know, find somebody to work with. Um, and this will be unpopular for some of the carnivores listening. But I mean, I've had women who are carnivore that do overdo it, right? They're like, maybe not eating enough fat, they lose their periods. And so, um, you know, there may be purposeful times where, you know, adding back in, you know, a few carbs here and there 
Um, I know Paul Saladino and I have debated this, that, you know, ancestrally, when you think about it, women really foraged a lot more. They, you know, didn't shoot the buffalo as much. Mm-hmm. Although if it was me, I would be chasing the buffalo. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they, you know, they may have had more berries and things like that, um, you know, off and on. And there's, there's, you know, if, if you lose your period, there's something not right. And so um, you want estrogen. So you want to be menstruating. You want your period, you guys. That is like a vital sign for women. If you lose your period, you're, you're overtraining or exactly the things that you're describing here, Kelly. Yeah, the way I got mine back, um, when I, I found the zeroing in on health, Charles Washington crew, Dana Spencer, who I'm talking to next week. She's fantastic. She is in the over 50 crowd and in the 12 year, she's a 12 year carnivore and she's doing, she makes it look so easy for her. It was a really easy transition, but when I met them and I said, you know, I'm not even having a cycle. Well, first of all, it was like, wow, your before and after pictures look good. I'm like, yes. And I said, you know, I'm not having a cycle. They were like, Oh, that's not good. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, whatever you're doing, it's working. You know, the world was telling me it's working. It's working. Look at you. You're losing weight. But they were like, but your health, something's not right. So they said, you need to cut back on this training thing. What are you training for home girl? <laughs> I mean, nothing. I'm just trying to get skinnier. And they were like, yeah, you're not getting healthier though. And then they really encouraged me not they didn't, of course, say to add back carbs, but they really wanted me to up my fat. And up your, yeah. Yeah. And the amount even, even adding that fat is like a refeed to the body. Yeah. Yes. So they said more fat and just more food. Cause I was, I was mm-hmm. still in like this restrictive. I'm kind of scared to eat mode because when you've been really overweight, it's kind of terrifying that you might go back. And so the idea of really eating can be hard to adjust to. I've gotten over it now. Yeah. <laughs> I really eat now and my cycles are regular, but just starting out. It was, you know, I was just scared to eat a lot. And they said, you've got to eat. You know, that's, yeah. there's, that was my problem anyway. Yeah, I find that sometimes when people start eliminating carbs from their diet, they're, especially if they're a high protein approach like carnivore, their satiety is so good. Um, they're like, oh yeah, I'm like never hungry. And I'm like, okay, yeah. but you have to eat. Like you can't just like not eat. And I think that sometimes people get very obsessive with like fasting and and that's a stress on the body too. So you have to remember that. I mean, everything in balance, just like that U shaped curve we talked about. So, all right. So this next week I'm having on these 50 plus women who are all long time carnivores. And at that point they will have already heard the things that you've had to say. And I want to hear their life experience of, I don't even know if they have tried any hormone replacement, estrogen? I don't know. We, we're not that close. I haven't asked them yet. <laughs> but I'm curious to hear if they've tried any of that and if they just did do you have night sweats but just powered through? Or, you know, was it a nothing, a non issue for them? I'm kind of yeah. curious because I yeah. might assume I, I, you have I'm curious too because we yeah. learn a lot from patients and. I did this post on estrogen the other day. And yeah, I mean, there was women on there that were like, oh, heck yeah, I take hormones. Don't ever take them away. I've been on them for 20 years. I mean, you will find these women. And then there was like one woman that was like, oh, I don't know. I tried them. I didn't, I didn't like the way I felt on them. I stopped them. So, I mean, that's the thing is like be your own expert, but just know that it's an option. There's some good benefits to it. And um, even if your diet's good, you might even feel better. For hormones, I've heard that just, Physical contact can actually help things regulate. You think that's true? Well, you're talking about like sex and orgasm. Um, These, yes, this system is like, so use it or lose it. So just like you need to work your bicep as you age, um, you need to use your woman parts and use your man parts as you age. um, Or we start to see atrophy and things like that in those places. And estrogen in particular for women is what provides lubrication to the vagina. So if you experience vaginal dryness after menopause, just know you can also use estrogen vaginally, like just vaginal estrogen therapy. And it is phenomenal at helping with um, just the elasticity in that tissue and the lubrication. It's not that you're broken. It's not that you're not eating the right way. That is just simply lack of estrogen. um, If you have vaginal dryness or like, especially pain with intercourse, but those parts are use it or lose it. So the more that you are, you know, experiencing orgasm and things like that. Um, yes, you get oxytocin release, you get estrogen release. I mean, menopause is menopause, but yeah, yeah the more you, the more you use those things, the better. So, getting sunshine, exercise, 
lots of meat, fat, good, healthy sex. What was it? What five am I missing? <laughs> Eat meat. Yeah. <laughs> Lift heavy things. Okay. Sleep and sex. <laughs> Got it. Less stress, more sunshine. Yes. No plastics. There you have it. I like that. <laughs> that's totally workable. Uh, that's good. Yep. Okay. So that got through most of like the higher level stuff. But now I just want to talk to you for a second if that's okay. okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the first time I ever um, saw you, I was like, who is she? You know how us women can get. And I'm sure men size each other. I was like, who is that? I've never heard. Dr. Fit and Fabulous, and I was like, her eyelashes look just as long as mine, and we've both been kind of vocal about the fact that we get a little help with the eyelashes. Okay, okay, but I don't know how it zoomed in I can get. These, these are glue ones because you convinced me. So for people that don't know, I won Mrs. Nebraska, but my coach said my extensions had to come off. So this eye currently has none on it. I, <laughs> I told my nurses I look like a cancer patient or something. But um, so these are glue on. People all the time message and say, what kind of mascara to use? I was like, hey, no mascara. <laughs> mascara won't do that. You have to get out glue for this. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I saw you. I was like, oh, there's a carnivore with some nice eyelashes. So then I would watch your videos. And then it happened. I just, I fell in love with you. I'll tell you the real turnaround. I watched you on the Titan Games. Then when you were the carnivore keto person on this show, against all these total strangers who eat pizza. Then I was like, that's my girl. And so then I'm sitting in a room and, you know, it's like, that's basically my best friend. <laughs> and so my family and I, we're all just cheering you on. And I liked you before that. But that's when I was like, oh, you just, when you're pulling for somebody, something about that really made me just click with you. And then I'm, then next thing I know, I'm interested in the Mrs. Nebraska competition. I'm like, what's happening? Now I'll watch you on Insta stories and you're always taking the stairs. And I love you. That's all there is to it. Okay, well, you're going to be so proud because I am competing at Mrs. America sometime this fall. I don't know. COVID, they haven't released a date. Okay. But I have three sponsors for Mrs. America and they are Real Salt, Piedmontese Beef, and Ancestral Supplements. So, you want to be cheering for your meat eater on stage? <laughs> oh, okay. My little moment of like, who is this? It was so brief because you're just so likable. I've, I've really liked you for a long time. And I'm partly just trying to be funny. And I know that we have differences on some things. My gosh, so does every single human. But we are so on the same page about so many things. Like just the absolute beauty of feeding ourselves and our families healthy, nutrient-dense foods, and the joy of eating meat. And my sister, that's all I really need to know. <laughs> women supporting women. It's important. Yes. Yes. And I know we're both moms of three, and we're both working full-time and trying to come on and do things like this. We're pulling babies out of vaginas and doing surgeries, and I am just a huge fan of yours. So I I'm, I'm really it. grateful that I you... I love you, too. And my mother was like... I want to watch your Zoom with Kelly Hogan. Can I get on there? <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Well, yesterday. I like you can be on repeat when this comes out. <laughs> My mom is not on social media, but I was showing her your pictures yesterday. I was like, and she said, yes, she's coming on the show. My mom was like, that is so good. <laughs> is your mom carnivore? Oh, no. She's not, but she watches, here's what's kind of cool. She watches my kids so much that she's actually cut way back on breads and sugars and everything yeah. because they're there and she won't eat it in front of them. My parents I, started eating like us and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, my dad, um, his diabetes is gone. He's off all of his diabetes meds, he's off his blood pressure medications. He's like, I mean like total 360. Yeah. Now, my dad does not eat a lot of carbs. My dad, I would say, is has for a long time, for health reasons, cut back a lot on carbs. He's not carnivore, but he does eat a lot of meat. But my mom, I don't really know what she does when we're not around. I'm not sure. But when we are around, she does eat a lot more like we do. Yeah. So maybe if I just hang out there a really long time, she'll live to be 120. 
social modeling. It's very hard to not do what everyone else is doing. So yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and she, you know, she would feel really uncomfortable at this point, like pulling out a bag of bread and making a sandwich in front of my kids. They think Mimi is carnivorish. They do because. That's all that she put up in front of them. <laughs> yeah, she follows, you know, what they do. She wouldn't do that in front of them. All right. I know that you are about to walk across Nebraska. How many miles? Um, I, it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be about between 50 and 60 miles. I'm walking from Lincoln, Nebraska to Omaha, Nebraska, Friday to Saturday to raise money for homeless veterans. And I've had a request to wear my crown the whole time, but I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a lot to ask, I feel like. I'm going to take some beef sticks, and okay. uh, it's going to be fine. Awesome. Just know that every single thing you do, you are going to have myself and three really cute little Hogans all in your corner on it all. We're here for it all, Dr. Fit and Fabulous. So please keep doing what you're doing, and thank you for coming and shedding a little light on what's happening in my body and in a lot of other women's bodies. I hope people enjoy it. I do, too. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.